pleasure to be back again. I gave a talk last month about uh, arrhythmias in the heart and the electrical signal. This time we're going to follow up with heart failure. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a cardiologist in the area. I also do um, heart failure and electrophysiology. So today we're going to concentrate on something that actually is the reason why I became a electrophysiologist was heart failure. When I was a student, I was seeing all these patients with shortness of breath, swelling, trouble with their exertion and weak hearts. And I started seeing these concepts of these devices. And if you haven't seen a device, I brought a copy of one with me. So this is a defibrillator. And this is actually why I do what I do now is because I saw this being implanted in a patient at uh, University of Southern California when I was doing my training. And I thought, that that concept of a device was very interesting that it could help someone's heart. Um, and so because of that, I had to also learn what the electrical signal of the heart was in order to do this. So that's how I started with my um, electrophysiology career. I also trained at University of Miami, University of Florida, and Oregon Health Science University. So when uh, young students see me or kids see me, they ask, how many years did you study? I said it took me 28 grades to do what I do now. But I enjoy it because of the job I have now, I'm, I'm able to use all of what I studied to help patients. And um, I really like the Adventist system because they go by a lot of the principles that I believe in. So it's, it's great to practice in this hospital and be able to use what I learned in order to help patients as well. So whenever we talk about the pumping of the heart and the concept of heart failure, because that's what we're discussing today. Heart failure is a condition that affects over 5 million Americans each year, and there's different things that lead to it. So I always start my talks by discussing what can we prevent, and those are your risk factors. So some things we can't prevent, and such, such as your age, we can't make you any younger. Or as I like to put it, I have gray hair at the age of 38. I can't prevent that, that's just my genetics. So genetics you cannot change, but things like your diet, things like your diabetes and how well controlled it is, things like blood pressure, cholesterol, um, smoking habits, and how active you are, very easily things that we can modify. So I, I got up at the gym this morning and went at 7 a.m. for an hour in the gym before I started my work day. And I told my trainer I'd gained some weight over the winter because I haven't been as active. So he asked me what I was eating for breakfast, because I think I eat pretty well, considering that I'm a cardiologist, I should eat very well. And I told him sometimes I have honey nut Cheerios, sometimes I have a piece of wheat toast, usually I eat egg, and he's like, well, that's okay, but he's like, you should probably cut out the wheat toast and the honey nut Cheerios. So he's that strict on my diet. And, he was, and I said, I like coffee, but I like to put a little creamer in there, and he's like, each creamer has 1.5 grams a fat in it. So he's like, if you really want to slim down, you need to cut all of that out. So if my trainer is telling me that at the age of 38, when I see my average patient in the 60s in my office, and they're telling me they're having bacon and eggs and pancakes and some juice and coffee on top of that, and they don't even know what they would do without their sugar and their creamer, you can imagine that it's, you know, it's a different conversation. But we'll get into that. But I bring that up to say that um, 80% of your body's composition can be affected by your diet. So you could be, my mom's in her 60s and she exercises for one hour the other day in the gym and she's bragging to me about it. But I tell her, it doesn't matter if you do one hour yesterday if you're eating very poorly at home or if you're not consistent with that one hour. I would rather see her do 20 minutes every day of walking and eat a little bit better than kill herself and get tired out and p pump it in the gym for one hour and then you know the rest of the week she's not doing much. So th the concept there is moderation and consistency. By doing that you'll have much more benefit for your heart and your risk factors. So common goals that uh, we want to do with anyone when it comes to heart and heart failure is prevent sudden death because a weak heart leads to more sudden death. A person with a squeeze of their heart uh, a good squeeze is 60%. So when you see your doctor and they say your echocardiogram, the ultrasound of your heart, the thing you want to know is what's your squeeze. So if your squeeze is 55, 60%, that's a normal number. 
I had one patient go to the ER immediately after I told them their heart squeeze was 60% because they thought that that was out of 100%. So I always clarify now, based on that experience, that it's 55 or 60 is a normal number. So if you have heart failure, your number is lower than 50%, and then if it's less than 35%, we consider that pretty severe. So when someone has heart failure, your risk of having an arrhythmia is 40 to 60 percent greater so that's why we use medicines to help prevent sudden death because most of that sudden death is due to arrhythmia. So the symptoms that most heart failure patients are sometimes very hard to tease apart. Um, fatigue and very tired when you're walking after a very short amount of exertion. Um, swelling in the legs, congestion in the lungs, shortness of breath in general. Those are some of the more common symptoms of heart failure. So more nonspecific ones and things that we try to look for, especially in men, is they'll present with more like indigestion sometimes. And that can get confusing because you think it's your stomach and it could be your heart that's causing that. So the reason why we use medicines is to try to improve these symptoms. And we're trying to reverse the structure of what's going on. So if you can improve your blood pressure, if you can improve your flow in your vessels, um, your heart can get stronger. So that's the concept of um, reverse remodeling. You're trying to reverse the process that has been going on from the disease state. Then there's many ways that we monitor somebody. We do EKGs, we do ultrasounds, we do Holter monitors. Those are all different ways of monitoring how someone's symptoms are doing and whether they're benefiting from the therapy that we used. If medicine is not enough, that's when we start talking about doing procedures such as cardiac caths to check your plumbing. I'm an electrician, that's how I explain it to the patients. I don't have anything to do with the plumbing. But when you see an interventionalist, when they put stents in the heart, that's involving the plumbing of the heart. Well, what's the benefit of that is if you can improve the flow in the heart, you can get it to be stronger again. So that's why we do uh, procedures such as stents in the heart. Um, if Stents in the heart and medicines are still not working, that's when we do device therapy. We put pacemakers when your heart rate is low, and patients always ask me that, what's the difference between a pacemaker and a defibrillator? A pacemaker's only purpose is to keep the heart rate high so that it doesn't go low again because of disease states. A defibrillator is always a pacemaker, but it also shocks the heart if you go into any type of arrhythmia. So that's the major difference. And the goal of all this is obviously to reduce death and also to give better quality of life to the patients. So some of the common causes of heart failure, the main things that I like to focus on are blood pressure. If your blood pressure is running too high and you're not controlling it well over time, that can cause heart failure. Uh, blockages in the plumbing, such as coronary disease or heart attacks, can lead to problems with heart failure. Uh, arrhythmias. If you have a lot of palpitations that are not being controlled with medications, that can also lead to heart failure. Those are the common cause of heart failure along with the risk factors that I discussed earlier. So when we talk about a functional class, I always ask patients how are they doing at home? How are they breathing? Is there any swelling in the legs? And you can place somebody in, in a d different categories. So someone who's very severely limited, is my patient comes in, he says, doctor, I walk to the mailbox. I could barely breathe, I got swelling in my legs, and I'm tired all the time. That's someone who's functionally in a class three or four, versus someone who's on good medicines, who's doing better at home, we would put them in a class two because they're basically able to do most of their normal activities, but when they do something that's very marked, like if they're trying to jog, and that gets them to be short of breath, well, that would be considered a class two. So we watch for patients because we want to see how they're doing functionally and if the medicines are um, doing well for them. If someone's having chest pain or they have risk factors for diabetes, so again the tobacco, the blood pressure, the fact that they're diabetic, those things lead to potentially plumbing problems in the heart. So what we like to do then is we check stress tests. We do nuclear stress tests to see the flow in the heart. We can do treadmill stress tests to see if there's any changes on the EKG. Um, and if, if there's a detection of a plumbing problem, then that's when we look to see if there's blockage. And patients always ask me when their stress test is abnormal, um, what are you looking for when we go inside the heart with a cardiac cath? Well, we go through uh, 
a peripheral stick in the leg or the arm and we're checking with a little bit of dye the three major vessels in the heart and you're looking for if there's blockage of 70% or greater. If there's 70% or greater, that's the only time that a doctor should put a stent in your heart. If the blockage is less than 70%, well, then we use medicines to help improve that flow and that function and to prevent progression. The first person in this room that invents a medicine that reduces that plaque will be a billionaire because everybody in the world will use that medication. But so far, there's been nothing that's shown to regress plaque, but we can prevent it from getting worse. So aspirin, beta blockers like Lopressor or Cardivatolol, ACE inhibitors like Lisinopril, Ramipril, these are the medicines that have been shown to help prevent progression, to prevent mortality. Um, we use cholesterol medicines to help prevent that plaque buildup from occurring. If you get to stent in the heart, then a very important medicine for that first year depending on the type of stent you get, is Plavix because it's helping prevent the plaque from forming on the vessels. So why am I focusing so much on plumbing is because plumbing leads to heart failure. So you, you won't get a weak heart if your plumbing is strong, blood pressure is controlled, and you don't have other risk factors going on. So we spoke a little bit about ejection fraction. A normal is about 50 to 60 percent. Anything less than that is considered some form of heart failure. Some patients uh, get very confused and I tell them all the time to ask their doctor. Doctors like to throw, especially primary doctors, like to throw around the term heart failure for any type of squeeze. Well, you could have a good squeeze of the heart, 60%, but you could still have fluid in the lungs. That's called diastolic heart failure. It's a problem with the way your heart relaxes. And we use that diuretics and me medicines to get rid of the water to help treat that but that's not systolic heart failure. Systolic heart failure is when the squeeze is not good and it's low. So um, it's always good to know what your ejection fraction is when you have heart failure. And then the medications are the beta blockers, the ACE inhibitors, the diuretics. These are the medicines we like to use to treat. Um, the EKG, we like to le measure electrically how the heart is doing. And there's terms that your doctors may use like left bundle branch block, right bundle branch block. Those are terms that say that your heart may have some delay with the way the heart rhythm is spreading in the heart. And sometimes we have to use different types of therapies to treat patients with bundles. So that's what this is speaking to as terms of QRS. We like to see QRS in your EKG of less than 120 milliseconds. When it's longer than that, that may need different types of medical therapy. And then we use cardiac MRI, ultrasounds of the heart, all types of different ways to see which parts of the heart are squeezing in different kinds of ways. So when someone has a weak heart, the only time you need a defibrillator, because my patients get nervous about this concept and I try to explain to them, the only reason you need a defibrillator if the medicines are not doing well for you and you've been on them for a long time, your heart's still remaining less than 35%, of a squeeze despite the medicines, or you've had a sudden cardiac arrest and you don't want to take that risk again, we put one of these in. So not everyone with heart failure needs a defibrillator. Um, so these are the common things that I look for in a patient. We're looking for their symptoms. We're checking how their heart failure is doing in terms of their EF. Um, I also recommend to patients if you're on the borderline, let's say your EF is 35%, 40%, and your doctor's not quite sure what to do with that. The tip I always tell every doctor then is to do a MUGA scan. A MUGA scan is where we are able to actually inject your blood and look at how the actual volume of the blood is. And it's kind of like a nuclear scan. You go into a CT machine and we take pictures of your heart. But the great thing about that is it's giving you a very accurate number of what your squeeze is. So if your heart failure is 20%, well, we know it's going to be lower than 35%. That's not a situation where you need a MUGA scan. And if your heart squeeze is 60%, you know your squeeze is good. Again, you don't need a MUGA scan. But if it's in that borderline range and you're trying to make up your mind about what to do, we check a MUGA to see a very accurate reflection of the flow in the heart. So this is uh, things that I deal with in clinic very often. And patients leave the hospital after having their heart attack Four months later, they're back on the golf course, they're playing golf, they're taking their medicines, 
they're feeling great and they're deciding to do different things that I would like them to do. They stop taking the medicines that we recommend or they're um, not taking medicines the way that we recommend or they're not following up the way we recommend. So then what can happen at that point is the heart can get weak as a result of not taking those medications. The blood pressure can go up, the weight can go up, which is very common. The sugar gets a little bit out of control. Or you're taking medicines and you're not getting blood work done to check how it's affecting your potassium or your kidneys or your hemoglobin because you're on blood thinners like aspirin, Plavix. So then I see a patient five, six, seven months later because now they're not feeling well. So those are things that I always emphasize to patients when you have heart issues, it's good to see your doctor every couple of months. Not as often as you see your primary, but you need to be checked to see if the medicines you're on are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and then we, we have conversations all the time about what patients want and what they don't want. So sometimes a patient doesn't want aggressive therapy and we try to minimize what we do. And then in um, Obamacare, which is a reality of medicine right now, you have to take cost involved. And if a patient can't afford certain medicines, we try to use generics as much as possible. But some medicines, they don't make generics and we have to work with the pharmacy industry to try to get cards that give some cost savings and those type of things. Or um, we try to use medications that are gonna give as much benefit as we can according to what you're able to get. Um, so these are common things that I discuss constantly with the patients in the clinic and about follow-up and about blood pressure and their labs and are their primaries checking certain things. So um, in terms of the device itself, some patients ask me, well, why do I need a pacemaker versus a defibrillator? So again, a defibrillator is only if you have a weak heart. A pacemaker is only you, if you have a, a weak electrical system where you're not getting enough heart rate. So what happens when you don't have enough heart rate? You get dizzy or you pass out or you present to the hospital after passing out or you're on a medicine that's lowering your heart rate and you're getting too tired from it. That's the times that we start thinking about a pacemaker. So some patients ask me, well, why do you put one lead in some patients and two leads in another patient? One lead is if someone has an arrhythmia like AFib and the lead is not gonna recognize what that rhythm is on the top, so we only put one lead in those type of patients. But if your normal heartbeat is there, we wanna see what your normal beat is doing and then only pace when necessary. So that's usually a patient we put two leads in. So there's a lot of different things that we look at um, in a device. And this is an example of a, of a ICD that is called a BIV. And patients ask me what a BIV is. Um, and the concept of that is you're putting one lead on the left side of the heart and one lead on the right side of the heart and it helps squeeze the heart. And so with patients who have a very wide QRS and who have a low squeeze of 35% or left, we can mechanically squeeze their heart again. And 70% of patients have improved breathing, more energy um, from that type of device. So when you have a device in the body and you're wanting to watch your heart failure, the benefit of the device is it's constantly watching your rhythm. It's looking if you're having any of these electrical uh, rhythms that may lead to cardiac arrest and it would shock you if that happened. It also gives us information about how your activity level is, about what your heart rate is doing, whether you're having AFib or uh, ATAC, which could lead to stroke. So in this patient, you can see that if they're not on any aspirin or any warfarin, that's a risk factor for them because they could lead to a stroke. So the device is monitoring how much of an arrhythmia their burden they're having. It shows also what their activity level is and we can discuss that with the patient if that's decreasing. It tells us what their heart rate is doing and how much they're pacing. So uh, it gives us a lot of information more than just what the function of it is. And this is a, an example of somebody who has arrhythmia called AFib, which is an irregular beating of the heart and how much they're having. And not only do we want to protect them against stroke, but we want to use medicines or therapies to help reduce the incidence of that. And we can monitor if they're getting benefit from the medications once they have a device in them. Um, 
and these type of things, the heart rate and the activity levels are important to see if the patient is actually progressing well with the type of medications and therapies they're on. Another uh, thing that I like to see on the devices, a defibrillator specifically, is it can actually watch the impedance is what it's, the concept is within your chest. And when the impedance rises, it means that the pressure and the fluid in the chest is getting worse and we like to see that on the device early on and increase your water pill to help prevent heart failure hospitalizations. So there's a very big emphasis of this by Medicare and CMS on the hospitals and we're trying to prevent readmissions because before patients would come into the hospital, they would get IV Lasix or something to help improve their heart failure. But in a week or two, sometimes they would come back very quickly because they were still very congested after the acute episode. So if you have a defibrillator, we watch that because patients with defibrillators have very weak hearts, so a greater risk for this issue. And if the impedance is rising, we're able to not be notified sooner and be able to tell the patient, you know what, over the last few weeks I see a trend that your heart is keeping more fluid and we need to adjust your medicines to help prevent that. So that's the concept of it is a drier lungs versus wetter lungs and when the impedance is changing we know what's occurring and we adjust the medications according to that. So um, an example of a typical patient that I would see in clinic is an 85 year old male who has heart failure. His squeeze here which we've been talking about the ejection fraction that you know by ultrasound is 20 percent. Probably his heart failure is from a combination of things. He had coronary disease plumbing problems. He was a diabetic. He had arrhythmia problems in the past, cholesterol problems, and he has a device implanted in him. And he's on the right medications here, very typical medications for somebody with um, these conditions. Lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor for blood pressure. Toporol is a beta blocker to help with the heart failure and help smooth out the heart rhythm. Bumex is a type of water pill to help get rid of that fluid in the, on the lungs and the legs. Coumadin is a blood thinner to help protect stroke when you have an arrhythmia. And amiodarone is a very fancy drug we use which has a lot of toxicities but helps smooth out you from having arrhythmias. So this slide brings up some important points. One thing is if you're on an ACE inhibitor, your potassium and your creatinine need to be monitored by your primary very carefully because those are things that can be affected. Also, ACE inhibitor occasionally can have a very severe side effect causing swelling of the tongue or of any part of the body or, help or allergic reaction where you can't breathe. So if you take any kind of medication, I always tell patients in those first few days on a new medicine or suddenly something changes, you need to inform your doctor if something is grossly abnormal from what you expect. Of course, this is a blood pressure medicine, so if you're getting dizzy and your blood pressure is going low, then you need to inform your doctor. So I always tell patients if you check your blood pressure, if that top number, your systolic is less than 100, you need to let your doctor know that because that's running a little bit low. Toporol is a heart rate medicine used very much in heart failure and also with coronary patients. It also helps smooth out arrhythmias. It has a little bit of effect on blood pressure, a lot of effect on heart rate, a very good medicine for heart failure. This medicine can cause fatigue, but I tell patients with any beta blocker like Lopressor, Carvedilol, Toporol, Bisperol, those kind of medicines, if you feel fatigue for the first two weeks, give it a little bit of time because that's normal. For After the first two weeks, usually you'll get used to that medicine and you'll have less fatigue. It can lower your heart rate and your blood pressure, so if you're feeling dizzy, you need to let your doctor know that. For men especially, it can cause erectile problems. So if you notice suddenly something is changing in the bed very dramatically and that isn't getting better after two weeks, then you need to let your doctor know that. But if that's occurring because you're also a diabetic and you're 90, you might have to let the good Lord deal with that in a different kind of way. Then there's a diuretic called Bumex. There's also Lasix, furosemide. Um, those kind of things um, are used for getting rid of water. So a very important thing for heart failure, so again we're speaking about heart squeezing less than 50%, is it's good to have a scale at home and to monitor your weight every morning before you take any medicines because that's your actual weight. If you notice over three to five days you're gaining three to five pounds, 
well, it's very unlikely that you've eaten that much food that quickly, so it's most likely that it's water. So if that's happening, then you need to let your doctor know so that you can increase your water pill. Most of my patients who see me often enough with heart failure, I just go ahead and tell them, if you notice <clears throat> that your um, weight is going up very suddenly, then just go ahead and take an extra water pill for a day or two and see if that corrects it. And then if it continues, then come see me in the office. But water pills are a great thing because they're treating an acute problem. If you've got swelling in the legs, you're not breathing well, you need water pills to get rid of that fluid. But over time, in a long period of time, your kidneys get resistance to them and you can need higher doses. So what I try to get patients to do who have mild to moderate heart failure is to take the least amount of water pill that they need to keep their weight at a baseline. When they get a little bit more wet, then we use more water pill. When the water comes off of them, we go back down on the dose. But some patients who have really bad kidneys or renal problems, we need to use higher doses constantly. And when the water pill isn't working, that's when you have to come in the hospital and we need to give you IV medicines because at that point we're not able to do uh, outpatient type of uh, treatment for it. Oh, um, and then to speak about these two last medicines, Coumadin is a blood thinner, and I love the way lawyers go after medicines nowadays on the TV. So Coumadin is known to cause bleeding. It's a blood thinner. So the lawyers put that on the TV and scare patients and say, if you're having any bleeding from this medicine, please call our office so that we can take your case. Well, any doctor who puts you on Coumadin without talking about the bleeding risk shouldn't be giving you that medicine in the first place. It's a blood thinner. If you notice blood in the stool or coming from the mouth or you're bruising severely, then you need to let your doctor know. Coumadin needs to be watched very carefully. If the number is greater than three or higher, it can cause bleeding. If the number is less than two, it's not protecting against stroke. So it's a very small window there that we're trying to keep it in between two and three. So you should be getting your blood checked at least once a month if you're on Coumadin. And if you're having any type of bleeding, you need to report that right away. If you have a valve of some type, sometimes we'll make the Coumadin number INR a little bit higher, 2.5. We also use Coumadin for patients who have embolus in the legs or the lungs, so there's different reasons we use it. But if you're on a blood thinner, if you have any type of bleeding or stroke signs, you need to let your doctor know. So what are stroke signs? If suddenly you can't speak well, you're not able to feel something in your hands or your legs more than what you normally have a problem with, or you suddenly can't move one side of your body, that's a sign of a stroke and you need to let the doctor know and come to the hospital right away. And for any patients who are on amiodarone, great medicine, it was made to protect against ventricular arrhythmias, which is coming from the bottom of the heart, but we often use it for supraventricular arrhythmias because it smooths out heart rate. We often use it for AFib, but the problem with that medicine is it can cause liver, thyroid, eye, and lung problems. So a lot of toxicities but it's a very good drug for what we use it for. So as long as you're getting your blood checked every three to six months with your primary and once a year for the eye and lungs, then that medicine's safe to use. But if you develop one of these problems, then we stop that medicine and we try to use something else. This is just talking about this particular patient and how what I was talking about, the impedance, so this is a patient who has heart failure who has one of these devices in their body and we're able to watch per month how the impedance is in the chest. Well, when it crosses this threshold and you see this peak here, he was actually more wet at that time based on the impedance and we can use medicines to help improve that. Um, and then also, if someone's in an arrhythmia, we can use medications to detect that, increase their water pills, help improve their kidney function, and help improve the underlying problems that are going on. So a lot of information on this slide, but the reason I like to show it is a very real example of how we use impedance to treat somebody and able to detect whether having a rhythm or not. So in that particular patient, it was because he was having a fib and also because the impedance went up as a result of that arrhythmia, we were able to increase the diuretic and change some of the parameters on the device to help um, treat the patient and then we can monitor to see later on whether that's improving or not in the patient. 
So in other ways that we watch the patient is again I said activity level and um, we're able to see whether someone is actually having an arrhythmia or whether they're doing something else. So commonly I'll, I have a patient who will wear a Holter monitor and the concept of that is we're watching the heart rhythm for 24 hours and seeing what they're doing and then the nurses will call me and say this heart rate is over 160 but that patient was jogging at that time. So you always have to take a look at what's happening clinically with what the device is showing. You don't want to treat somebody aggressively for something that's not going on. So I'm going to skip through some of these. These are just all different types of exa examples of how we can use these devices to monitor what's going on with the impedance. Um, so just like any device, there's problems that can happen with these types of uh, uh, impedance levels. And uh, if you have dehydration, if your kidneys are having problem, if you have a lung issue like COPD, sometimes we can get fooled with the impedance, but that's why you're seeing a physician. You're not just having a monitor tell you something and then treating it without having someone also know what your physical is, your blood pressure is, what your risk factors are. Um, and so we make sure that that's actually what's going on rather than just treating what the device is saying. In any patient who has heart failure, your goal for that patient is quality of life, being able to breathe better, and to have less swelling in any part of the body. Not only is it in your legs, because sometimes I see my patients and it's in their abdomen. If you gain 15 pounds of water in your abdomen, you can be sure that you're not breathing well. So it's not always just in your legs. And just because you have swelling in your legs doesn't always mean you have heart failure. So primaries love to send me patients who have swelling in their legs, but their squeeze is 60%, so that's a normal number, and they have no risk factors. Well, then you gotta look at very common things because I always tell my patients, if you're my mom or dad, I'm gonna give you the same advice as if they were sitting in front of me. So are you eating too much salt? because salt is what's keeping your water in your body in the first place. So if you're, if you're telling me that you're eating pizza and french fries and potato chips and a box of pickles and you're wondering why you got swelling in your legs, I'm gonna tell you you're crazy because that's what's causing the swelling, not heart failure. But you can conservatively treat that. You reduce the salt load. You raise your legs in the evenings. You can use compression stockings, although patients don't like that. Sometimes it's a venous problem. If you have uh, venous incompetence where you're veins are very swollen, they're not pumping the blood back up to the heart. And so sometimes we have to fix that problem and you can check that very easily by an ultrasound. And if you have ulcers on the legs or color changes on the legs, that's when we think about venous problems. Sometimes it's an arterial circulation problem. So if you're not getting good flow in the legs, the pulses are not good, again you have ulcers, you're walking and then when you're resting your legs cramping gets better, those are signs of claudication. That's the term claudication. And again, we can do an ultrasound to check to see if there's an arterial problem in the legs. So swelling in the legs is not always a sign of heart failure. And again, another thing is just because you're short of breath doesn't mean you have heart failure. So if a doctor goes into the ER and they call me about a 22-year-old female patient who's short of breath, who's also got asthma, well, it's not her heart that's causing the problem, it's her lungs. And if you tell me you're smoking a pack a day and you got green phlegm or yellow phlegm coming up and you're not using your nebulizers, well, it's chances that's your COPD that's causing your shortness of breath. Or if you've just recently went on vacation and you gained 20 pounds from eating and you haven't been exercising, well, it's probably your weight that's causing shortness of breath. So we have to look at the big picture and make sure that it's not something that you can fix before we do fancy things for the heart because those are very common things that patients complain about and then they get confused about whether it's their heart or not that's doing it. So if you're having chest pain, you're having fast heart rates, you're having dizziness, your blood pressure is not well controlled, your heart squeeze is uh, good and you're still having swelling despite the medicines, then that's when you need to talk to a heart doctor about what they can do to help improve some of those things. So I'm going to leave a little bit of time to ask questions because I generally see that people have a lot of questions. You can ask me anything about risk factors. You can ask me about any of your medications. If you have a specific question about heart failure 
or about something that I touched upon, I'll be more than happy to go into a detail.